This is the Open University. University again, and I, I've been sort of um, a little absent for the last couple of weeks because I was in Scotland, first of all, promoting the new edition of the Book of Scotland and uh, doing events in Glasgow and Edinburgh, hanging out with my mother. Um, first time I've seen her since she became a widow, so that was quite important. And we went up to um, to the um, the garden of Ian Hamilton Finlay, which is called Little Sparta, a beautiful sculpture garden. Uh, about an hour's drive south of Edinburgh. The weather was typically Scottish. It was sort of drizzling, pouring, um, uh, intermittently sunny because it's windy there all the time as well. It's kind of windy here and, and getting chilly uh, also here in Berlin. I've had a cold for the last week. I think I picked it up from the air conditioning on the Ryanair flight back from Glasgow. Uh, I had a great time at my events. Thank you, anyone who came and uh, signed lots of books. The book looked great in its production, final production copy. And uh, now I'm back, I'm just sort of uh, um, writing my next book, which is for Farrar, Strauss and Giroux in New York, who are the um, reputable literary publishers I've been mentioning. And um, so I've been uh, sort of struggling with, with various different entry points to that. It was meant to be a, a drugs memoir about someone who'd never done drugs. That was sort of the original idea. But I burned out very quickly on that theme because I, I, I've... I've never done drugs, and I, you can't really write about that facetiously because a lot of people have suffered and died through their drug addictions and things, and it seemed, you know, disrespectful to them. Uh, and also, it's it's me bullshitting, you know, in in a way that might not be funny after a while. It's meant to be a seventy five thousand word memoir, so I think, you know, I quickly ran out of that. But I, I came up just last Friday with this brilliant new machinery and structure for the book which is um, it's combining my particular experiences in music and, and life in general with um, the social context of the time. And I'm not going to go into how I do that. It was a, a sort of a light bulb moment, really, um, a way that will sustain my interest in writing the book. I won't get bored with it. Uh, it's sort of amusing to read as well. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm not going to talk anymore because I might jinx the whole thing. Um, but it, it works. It simply works. It's working on, on the writing level. I've written 5,000 words already of the seven, 75,000 words. So, I mean, I'll basically be working on it through the winter and into next year, into the spring. Um, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. Uh, the other thing, <clears throat> I really enjoy just being in this flat, you know, just uh, padding around from room to room. And what I've been doing in order to kind of stay active inside the house, because I love using my body, um, is I've been changing around, reordering my bookshelves, <clears throat> basically deplastifying my, my bookshelves because they were full of cassettes, you know, videotapes, CD-ROMs, um, all sorts of ugly plastic things which are now dead formats mostly, which don't even play back. I, I barely have the equipment to play them on, to look at my old DV tapes, to listen to my DAT tapes, which used to be my masters for my recordings and, you know, the things which seemed like the future actually were not the future. You know, DAT tapes had a lifespan of, what, 20 years, CDs had about the same, maybe 30 years, and now there is nothing more useless than a CD, this thing, this thing wrapped in splintering plastic. So I, I basically took all that junk out of my bookshelves, out of the Trissa cabinets, which are actually originally meant to be vinyl, 12-inch cabinets, but they're great for books. I love the way they look and and how you can sort of, they're modular basically, so you can make your bookshelves anywhere you want. So I, t I took all the CDs and everything out and put them in different places, put the cassettes, stowed the cassettes in secret little nooks and crannies here in the kitchen. The cassettes are actually the most uh, interesting part of that plastic side of my archives because they've got amazing recordings going back to the 1970s. 
Um, and so I'm listening to those sort of as I work, you know, I'll have a cassette on of me and my brother and sister and my parents, you know, having a casual conversation in the breakfast room in Nine Drummond Place in 1978, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, it's very reassuring. And it also allows me to travel through time since I'm writing this memoir as well. The memoir has got up to the year 1967 at the moment, um, hasn't yet got to the point where we as a family depart for Greece. And, um, but, uh, it's sort of interesting just to, to travel back to any of those previous years and do it with... Um, that's always been what's fascinated me about technology, including even making these these videos. That I can look at a video I made a year or so ago when I was living in Osaka, and I didn't realise I was going to be leaving Osaka, and it now has the quality of a different life. So you have this sense <clears throat> of, of having lived multiple lives in multiple locations, and that's all very exciting. It makes a lifetime feel very long. Uh, I have no impression of um, life speeding up, as people say it does in later life, because I've lived in you know so many different places this year. I've been in, what, six different countries. And um, so, yeah, I've deplastified the books, and along the top row now is all the kind of French 1960s paperbacks, which I favour, these radical libertine paperbacks uh, published by NRF, by um, 1018, uh, Le Point, Christian Bourgeois, uh, all this kind of literary stuff, Natalie Savot and all these people, which I, I really go for. Um, I guess because it's it's back to the future. It's a sort of optimistic and um, forward-looking avant-gardism, which has disappeared from the world in some sense. You know, we've replaced that with populism and with accessibility and with all sorts of democratic virtues and even now fascist virtues, which are kind of replacing and effacing the democratic virtues. Um, and it's all gone to hell. Uh, you know, that idea of who are the avant-garde now, I really don't know. Are they people who are climbing tall buildings and videoing themselves fall into their deaths? Possibly they are. But um, for me, in my sort of comforting, relaxed, kind of pontoufle way, here are my slippers, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm clinging to people like uh, Natalie Sarwood as, you know, advanced and exciting. I'm actually, I'm still reading the Philip Larkin biography, uh, which is kind of um, a bit more English, obviously, a bit more Eeyore-ish, a bit more depressive. But uh, he was such a, an entertaining letter writer as well. I've got his letters open at about the same page as the biography, so I'm sort of reading those two books in tandem. But um, I'm also reading a really interesting rock book by my friend Anthony Reynolds, which I'm actually reviewing for The Wire quite soon, uh, about the post-Japan careers of Mick Kahn, David Sylvia, and, and all the others from, from Japan. So um, uh, uh, it's, that's a good example of a straightforward rock narrative which works, uh, which is not tricksy and not pretentious in any way, uh, just sort of talks about the brand of tape, you know, and the kind of tensions in the studio and the... To a certain extent about the drugs and the personal lives, the mistresses and all the rest of it, obviously Japan split up because a Japanese woman who had been Nick Khan's girlfriend became David Sylvian's girlfriend. Um, it, it's been reminding me how important David Sylvian's Brilliant Trees album was to me um, when I became Momus, when I went solo uh, after my band The Happy Family. Bowie was obviously on the skids with that awful record uh, tonight which, you know, I can't even listen to, those dreadful cover versions of Iggy Pop songs and uh, Brian Wilson songs and things. Just dismal. Apart from that one good track, which is uh, Loving the Alien. Um, so we turned, those of us who wanted a template for what modern music should sound like, we turned to Brilliant Trees, which is a fantastic record using quite jazzy instrumentation like uh, stand-up bass and prepared piano. It's, it's jazzy, but it's also avant-garde, lightly avant-garde. There's a certain coffee table quality to it. Um, and I'm also in two minds about the plagiarism, which David Sylvian really... He, he's a bit humorless and, and, and also plagiaristic in the sense that, as he sings himself in, um, what's it called, After the Bullfight, uh, guilty of stealing everything I own. Um, I think that's kind of true because all the titles he uses, all the lyrics he uses are from the titles of Jean-Paul Sartre and Jacques Cocteau and Antonin Artaud books, you know. It's the same kind of stuff I'm into, so I'm very indulgent of it. I'm very forgiving of it. And I like, I think in a kind of gender politics way, I like the idea of being an effete man who's not um, aggressively masculine, 
Even Bowie, compared with Sylvian, looks aggressively masculine. And probably he disdained um, Sylvian for precisely that reason. For I mean, you can't, Bowie couldn't have disdained anybody for lack of originality because he was, as Picasso said, you know, genius steals. Um, he was stealing just as much as anyone. But uh, he, I think he would probably have seen it on the level of sort of a feetness and lack of punch, you know. Uh, they had very different models. And Sylvian's is attractively based on Joni Mitchell. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I had been a huge fan of Joni Mitchell in the 70s, and so I kind of liked that Sylvian was using that. Prince also, rather surprisingly, using Joni Mitchell um, as a template in the 80s. My early demos, which I'm listening to on tapes now, are very Johnny Mitchell-esque. I mean, the pre-Beast um, of Three Backs demos that I was making sound much more... The way I'm singing and the kind of... The ambiguities in the chords and the jazziness in the performance is all very influenced by records like Hegira. So Hegira in the 70s is kind of replaced in the 80s by records like uh, Brilliant Trees. Um, the other thing I've been thinking about this week is the big scandal in um, New York with Ian Baruma being... Uh, fired from the editorship of the New York Review of Books for having given a platform to Jim Gomeshi, the CBC interviewer, who actually did interview Johnny Mitchell in a very sympathetic and good interview uh, and was apparently was into kind of physical violence with his girlfriends and um, stood trial after more than 20 accusations from ex-girlfriends um, uh, apparently, you know, it's very difficult to know how consensual they were. They seem to have been quite consensual, but um, he was exonerated after a court case, and um, but basically um, condemned on Twitter, uh, condemned in the public mind, and had to, you know, his career was in ruins. He, he basically, so he was. They were doing the, uh, an issue, a theme issue of the New York Review of Books called "The Fall of Men," uh, which was talking about. Um, the endemic problems of masculinity, but particularly this thing which John Ronson described in his book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, about being tried extrajudicially, uh, being tried on Twitter rather than in a courthouse. So you can even you can win the day in the courthouse, which Gomeshi did with the, the aid of apologising to certain of, of the, the, the plaintiffs, the complainants, and, um, and settling out of court, I think, with one of them, um, but uh, basically, there was the, it, the case against him was not upheld, and he was exonerated. But his career was finished. So, quite a, a difficult situation for him. And and because he seemed to be portraying himself as the victim in this um, article, um, not so much him being rounded on on Twitter now, but it's um, Baruma, the editor, for not having apparently put enough counterbalancing. They've now, it's still up online, but they've put all sorts of prefaces and warnings and, you know, trigger alerts and things around it. But there's also a backlash against the backlash. There's a lot of people saying this is, we can't have this atmosphere where people are afraid to even stand up for people who are exonerated in court uh, because they think Twitter is going to backlash against them or, or publishers who don't want to take risks, fire them rather than just soldiering on with them. Ian Baruma, politically, I think, is a bit problematical. Uh, he seems to have aligned himself with the Islamo-fascism kind of mentality of people like Martin Amos. He was a big influence on me also in the 80s. I mean, you know, if you listen to my song Bishonen, it's very much influenced by a chapter called The Third Sex, which is, in Ian Baruma's book, The Japanese Mirror, Heroes and Villains of Japanese Culture, which was a super important title for me in the 80s. And um, so that... Um, yeah, that song that starts, I was born in the town of Paisley in early 1960 and placed in the care of an old eternal bachelor. And so that line is still being picked up to this day. I was described at some of these events in Scotland the other week as the um, Paisley-dwelling pop intellectual momus. Um, I haven't been a Paisley-dwelling anything since I was born, because basically just because there was a memorial, there was some, the, the, something memorial hospital, which was a new hospital built in Paisley where you could have babies. My mother was shifted, we lived in Glasgow in a, a basement in Crown Gardens in the Hillhead area, and my mother was shifted up to this new hospital, had me 
was, was sent straight home to Glasgow. So I, I have no memory of Paisley at all. I haven't been back except for using the airport. Glasgow airport is pretty much in Paisley um, since. And uh, so I was brought up in Edinburgh. And um, <clears throat> that, you know, lecture beware, um, caveat lecture, the, um, that combination of, of truth and, and fiction is really how I write. Uh, and it's how I'm kind of writing this memoir about my life as well. You can, I think the highest art is, is using, as Picasso said again, to um, art is the lie that tells the truth. So the highest art is using a kind of fictional, obviously constructed framework and then putting real facts and real emotions into it, real things you did and experienced into that. Um, so although I'm being, my book has been published on the non-fiction side of um, FSG, it is kind of using a... Um, a construction which is obviously uh, artificial and artistic to put real meat on onto. That skeleton is um, a, a construct, but I'm putting real facts about my life. Trying to be as honest as possible. I think you need to do that. I think every story, every narrative is constructed in a way, and the more honest the narrative claims to be, and unvarnished it claims to be, the more tricksy it is, in fact. So I think a, an honest, a really honest narrative starts off with the premise that it is kind of... Um, a narrative, and that there's no point denying that, and in fact you might even want to highlight that to, to really keep the reader on his or her toes. So that's what I'm doing, that's how I'm writing my book just now, and it's, um, it's a structure which I know will work and which will see me through to the, the completion of the book. Um, and um, of course there are moments when I think, oh God, will I be the next Twitter victim? I'm not really famous enough to, to be outed on Twitter as anything, but um, and I haven't, you know, I haven't been evil. I don't think I've been an evil person. I'm, I, there, but I have, there have been wickednesses in my life which I'm actually very interested to describe. I, I, the way I'm writing the book, I'm sort of thinking, hmm, should I talk about this particular... And I always do, in the end, want to write about the end. Because you can't just portray yourself as a kind of one-dimensional saintly genius or whatever. You have to show the, the shadow sides. And, and the kind of books I, I like reading... Show, show people's dark sides, you know. Um, I was just reading some Charles Bukowski, for instance, and really enjoying the straightforwardness and directness and sort of brutal unsentimentality of his takes on, on just the awful odd jobs he had or his own sexuality. Uh, that's, that sort of confessional literature is really something I admire, people's honesty about, you know, the, the ambivalent sides of themselves, the dark sides of themselves. Not just in that French libertine tradition of uh, épater le bourgeois, but also in um, the Puritan tradition of honesty, yeah, uh, self-assessment and uh, humility. And the, and the question you have to ask yourself is, are, are we still in a kind of age where it's possible to do that and be greeted by sympathy? Or are we in an age when you would actually, you know, become a a victim of witch hunting and um, public shaming. Uh, so, but, you know, I don't think, I think life is too short to worry about that kind of thing or to worry about, I think you have to be brave and you have to put yourself out there. Draw blood. I think I was saying, I was talking about some vloggers, you know, I think people now are, would probably have a tendency more to be, to be vloggers than writers, you know, that's the, what young people, you know, creative young people are, are doing what I'm doing right now. And um, some of them are doing it with slick patter and jokes, you know, and being entertaining with it. Um, but others are kind of going to very interesting areas of uh, vulnerability and confession. And um, so this guy I watch in Osaka, um, who's uh, called Daniel, is kind of doing that. I mean, he's, he's married now, and so he's, he's passed from the either to the or in Kierkegaardian terms. You know, he's, he's passed into the supposedly ethical life of marriage. Uh, so it's not quite as spicy as it used to be. He used to talk very frankly about his sex life. Um, but nevertheless, he, he's a little glimmer of hope, as far as I can see, that not everything has to be slick and commercial. He, he's very commercial too. He puts lot, lots of advertising around these confessions. YouTube is getting increasingly difficult because YouTube is trying to be family-friendly to suit the advertisers. And even if you just put up non-commercial content, as I'm doing, I'm a partner on YouTube, I could put adverts in these, but I choose not to. But they will actually downgrade you uh, for, do, for not 
advertising for not commercializing your videos now. It's not enough that we're providing them with free content. They also want us to be providing them with advertising revenue on every single video. So um, I'm not being recommended on any of these videos because I don't advertise, you know. And that's just my choice. I know that it, it, it condemns me to a very limited audience of a thousand people or whatever, but um, at the moment that's how I'm choosing to play it, but you're, you're sort of like St. Anthony standing on his column, you know, you're, uh, and there's an earthquake, you know, YouTube and all these platforms are constantly monetizing with ever greater ferocity and acumen, and the algorithm is what determines our lives now. YouTube has its own algorithms of, you know, is this guy, um, is this guy monetizing or not? And if not, Let's put him down there. <laughs> so that's the situation I'm in. Um, round about the time the book comes out, I'll probably have to resort to other ways to get noticed because I'm obviously trying to break out of this uh, enclave, this little clique of interested people. Uh, and and th that's the moment, actually, in my experience, in my career, whenever I've broken through, in the West anyway, in Japan it was different because you don't get critical voices in Japan in quite the same way. But in the West, the moment you break out of your little enclave, you, the, you break out of preaching to the choir, in other words, is when you get a lot of negative flack. A lot of people get you forced under their noses and get angry about that and don't want to deal with you and don't want to have to listen involuntarily to, to what you're doing. And so um, that's when you, you get people attacking you and saying nasty things, which is fine. You know, I can deal with nasty things being said. Um, I think I'm fairly... <laughs> I'm fairly thick-skinned, especially when people will spell things badly. I don't really care what they say if they can't do spelling and grammar. I'm a bit of a snob about that. I was just watching a really great documentary about Herbert Reed, because I mentioned Herbert Reed in the, in the bit of the book I was writing, and um, what an interesting character Herbert Reed was. He co-founded the ICA with Roland Penrose. He was really an anarchist and, and weirdly spiritual as well. He wrote a book called The Green Child, a sort of weird allegory. Um, but, but writing mostly about modern art and um, basically saying that we mustn't give in to populism and we mustn't give in to kind of facile and glib um, entertainment values and that art has to, has to be a bit of an ivory tower and a bit apart in order to represent something to aspire to and something which might come from the future or might come from other cultures or, you know, it has to have that essential strangeness to it. And, and a sort of spiritual integrity to it, uh, which he, <laughs> I was going to say, which he evinced, you know, personally when you see him being interviewed and, and all the rest of it. He looks a bit like Bertrand Russell. But then he was friends with Eric Gill, you know, so there is the, Eric Gill, who was this um, uh, paedophile sculptor, and, you know, but also a very interesting character, very fascinating to read about if you read uh, Fiona McCarthy's book about him. You know, these, I always find the most interesting people are the most speckled, morally speckled. Um, they have very, very high moral standards on the one hand, and then they, they totally fall, <laughs> on the other hand, into the, the most smelly, sulfurous regions of hell. So Eric Gill was certainly one of those, and, and Herbert Reed was his, his good mate. Um, so really, you, you never know. You can't really, um, I don't think you can stand in judgment of those people. Uh, and um, it's, all, it's all very fascinating. But a great film. Um, uh, I can put a link to the documentary under this, perhaps. I'm, I'm flying off to the Venice Biennale tomorrow uh, on my way to a concert in uh, Bologna. I have some poetry evening in a palazzo in Bologna, which I don't even know if it's open to the public. I think it's open to the public. I'm not sure. Then I'm in Paris the week after that, um, performing in the uh, Nuit Blanche des Musées, the long white night of the museums. And then I'm back here, and that's really um, where I want to be. I want to be padding around my beautiful uh, white boards in my slippers, um, rearranging my library, and getting on with my book. So um, that's where I am just now. Thank you for listening. Open University.